Lawrence struck while the iron was hot, and before the blighted being recovered spirit enough to rebel, they were off. During the time necessary for preparation, Lorry bore himself as young gentlemen usually do in such cases. He was moody, irritable, and pensive by turns, lost his appetite, neglected his dress, and devoted much time to playing tempestuously on his piano, avoided, unlike some sufferers, he never spoke of his unrequited passion, and would allow no one, not even Mrs. March, to attempt consolation or offer sympathy. On some accounts, this was a relief to his friends, but the weeks before his departure were very uncomfortable, and every one rejoiced that the poor, dear fellow was going away to f Of course, he smiled darkly at their delusion, but passed it by with the sad superiority of one who knew that his fidelity like his love was unalterable. When the parting came he affected high spirits, to conceal certain inconvenient emotions which seemed inclined to assert themselves. This gaiety did not impose upon anybody, but they tried to look as if it did for his sake, and he got on very well till Mrs. March kissed him, with a whisper full of motherly solicitude. Then feeling that he was going very fast, he hastily embraced them all round, not forgetting the afflicted Hannah, and ran downstairs as if for his life. Jo followed a minute after to wave her hand to him if he looked round. He did look round, came back, put his arms about her as she stood on the step above him, and looked up at her with a face that made his short appeal eloquent and pathetic. Oh, Jo, can't you, Teddy? Dear, I wish I could, that was all, except a little pause. Then Laurie straightened himself up, said it's all right, never mind, and went away without another word. Uh, but it wasn't all right, and Joe did mind, for while the curly head lay on her arm a minute after her heart answer, she felt as if she had stabbed her dearest friend. And when he left her... Chapter 36 Beth's Secret When Joe came home that spring, she had been struck with the change in Beth. No one spoke of it or seemed aware of it, for it had come too gradually to startle those who saw her daily. But to eyes sharpened by absence... It was very plain, and a heavy weight fell on It was no paler and but littler thinner than in the autumn, yet there was a strange, transparent look about it, as if the mortal was being slowly refined away, and the immortal shining through the frail. Joe saw and felt it, but said nothing at the time, and soon the first impression lost much of its power, for Beth seemed happy. No one appeared to doubt that she was better, and presently another. But when Laurie was gone and peace prevailed again, the vague anxiety returned and haunted her. She had confessed her sins and been forgiven, but when she showed her savings and proposed a mountain trip, Beth had thanked her heartily, but begged not to go so far away from home. Another little visit to the seashore would suit her better, and as Grandma could not be prevailed upon to leave the babies, Joe took Beth down to the quiet place, where she could live much in the open. It was not a fashionable place, but even among the pleasant people there, the girls made few friends, preferring to live for one another. Beth was too shy to enjoy society, and Joe too wrapped up in her to care for anyone else. So they were all in all to each other, and came and went, quite unconscious of the interest they excited in those about them, who watched with sympathetic eyes the strong sister and the feeble one. They did feel it. Yet neither spoke of it, for often between ourselves and those nearest and dearest to us there exists a reserve which it is very hard to overcome. Jo felt as if a veil had fallen between her heart and Beth's, but when she put out her hand to lift it up, there seemed something sacred in the silence, and she waited for Beth to speak. She wondered, and was thankful also, that her parents did not seem to see what she saw, and during the quiet weeks when the shadows grew so plain to her, she said nothing of it to them. She wondered still more if her sister really guessed the hard truth, and what thoughts were passing through her mind during the long hours when she lay on the warm rocks with her head in Joe's lap, while the winds... One day Beth told her. Joe thought she was asleep. She lay so still, and putting down her book, sat looking at her with wistful eyes, trying to see signs of hope, in the faint color on Beth's, 
but she could not find enough to satisfy her, for the cheeks were very thin, and the hands seemed too feeble to hold even the rosy little shells they had been collecting. It came to her then more bitterly than ever that Beth was slowly drifting away from her, and her arms instinctively tightened their hold upon the dearest treasure she possessed. For a minute her eyes were too dim for seeing, and when they cleared, Beth was looking up at her so tenderly that there was hardly any need for her to say, Joe, dear, I'm glad you know. I've tried to tell you, but I couldn't. There was no answer except her sister's cheek against her own, not even tears, for when most deeply moved, Joe did not cry. She was the weaker then, and Beth tried to comfort and sustain her, with her arms about her and the soothing words she whispered in her ear. I've known it for a good while, dear, and now I'm used to it. It isn't hard to think of or to bear. Try to see it so and don't be troubled about me because it's best. Indeed it is. Is this what made you so unhappy in the autumn, Beth? You did not feel it then, and keep it to yourself. Yes, I gave up hoping then, but I didn't like to own it. I tried to think it was a sick fancy, and would not let it trouble anyone. But when I saw you all so well and strong and full of happy plans, it was hard to feel that I could never be like you, and then I was miserable. Joe, oh, Beth, and you didn't tell me. Perhaps it was wrong, but I tried to do right. I wasn't sure, no one said anything, and I hoped I was mistaken. It would have been selfish to frighten you all when Marmy was so anxious about Meg, and Emmy away, and you so happy with Laurie, at least I thought so then, and I thought you loved him, Beth. Beth looked so amazed at the idea that Joe smiled in spite of her pain, and added softly, then you didn't, dearie. I was afraid it was so, and imagined your poor little heart. I do love him dearly. He is so good to me, how can I help it? But he could never be anything to me but my brother. I hope he truly will be sometime. Not through me, said Joe decidedly. Emmy is left for him, and they would suit excellently, but I have no heart for such things. Now, I don't care what becomes of anybody but you, Beth. You must get well. I want to, oh, so much I try, but every day I lose a little and feel more sure that I shall never gain it back. It's like the tide, Joe, and it turns. It goes slowly, but it can't be stopped. It shall be stopped. Your tide must not turn so soon. Nineteen is too young. I can't let you go. I'll work and pray and fight against it. I'll keep you in spite of everything. There must be ways. It can't be too late. God won't be so cruel as to take you from me, cried poor Joe rebelliously, for her spirit was far less piously submissive than Beth's. Simple, sincere people seldom speak much of their piety. It shows itself in acts rather than in words, and has more influence than homilies or protestations. Beth could not reason upon or explain the faith that gave her courage and patience to give up life and cheerfully wait for death. Like a confiding child, she asked no questions, but left everything to God and nature, father and mother of us all, feeling sure that they and they only could teach and strengthen. She did not rebuke Joe with saintly speeches, only loved her better for her passionate affection, and clung more closely to the dear human love from which our father never means us to be we. She could not say, I'm glad to go, for life was very sweet for her. She could only sob out, I try to be willing, while she held fast to Joe, as the first bitter wave of this great sorrow broke over them together. By and by Beth said with recovered serenity, you'll tell them this when we go home. I think they will see it without words, sighed Joe, for now it seemed to her that Beth changed everything. Perhaps not. I've heard that the people who love best are often blindest to such things. If they don't see it, you will tell them for me. I don't want any secrets, and it's kinder to prepare them. Meg has John and the babies to comfort her, but you must stand by father and mother. Want you, Joe, if I can. But, Beth, I don't give up yet. I'm going to believe that it is a sick fancy, and not let you think it's true, said Joe trying to speak cheerfully. 
Beth lay a minute thinking, and then said in her quiet way, I don't know how to express myself, and shouldn't try to any one but you, because I can't speak out except to my Joe. I only mean to say that I have a feeling that it never was intended I should live long. I'm not like the rest of you. I never made any plans about what I'd do when I grew up. I never thought of being married as you all did. I couldn't seem to imagine myself anything but stupid little Beth, trotting about at home, of no use anywhere but there. I never wanted to go away, and the hard part now is the leaving you all. I'm not afraid, but it seems as if I should be homesick for you even in heaven. Joe could not speak and for several minutes there was no sound but the sigh of the wind and the lapping of the tide. A white-winged gull flew by, with the flash of sunshine on its silvery breast. Beth watched it till it vanished, and her eyes were full of sadness. A little gray-coated sandbird came tripping over the beach, peeping softly to itself, as if enjoying the sun and sea. It came quite close to Beth, and looked at her with a friendly eye and sat upon a warm stone, dressing its wet feathers, quite at home. Beth smiled and felt comforted, for the tiny thing seemed to offer its small friendship, and remind her that a pleasant world was still to be enjoyed. Dear little bird, see, Joe, how tame it is. I like peeps better than the gulls. They are not so wild and handsome, but they seem happy, confiding little things. I used to call them my birds last summer, and mother said they reminded her of me busy, Quaker-colored creatures, always near the shore, and always chirping that contented little... You are the gull, Joe, strong and wild, fond of the storm and the wind, flying far out to sea, and happy all alone. Meg is the turtle dove, and Emmy is like the lark she writes about, trying to get up among the clouds, but always dropping down into its nest again. Dear little girl, she's so ambitious, but her heart is good and tender, and no matter how high she flies, she never will forget home. I hope I shall see her again, but she seems so far away. She is coming in the spring, and I mean that shall be all ready to see and enjoy her. I'm going to have you well and rosy by that time, began Joe feeling that of all the changes in Beth. The talking change was the greatest, for it seemed to cost no effort now. Joe, dear, don't hope any more. It won't do any good. I'm sure of that. We won't be miserable, but enjoy being together while we wait. We'll have happy times, for I don't suffer much, and I think the tide will go out easily if you help me. Joe leaned down to kiss the tranquil face, and with that silent kiss, she was right. There was no need of any words when they got home, for father and mother saw plainly now what they had prayed to be saved from seeing. Tired with her short journey, Beth went at once to bed, saying how glad she was to be home, and when Joe went down she found that she would be spared the hard task of telling Beth's secret. Her father stood leaning his head on the mantelpiece and did not turn as she came in, but her mother stretched out her arms as if for help, and Joe went to comfort her without a word. Chapter 37 New Impressions at 3 o'clock in the afternoon All the fashionable world at nice may be seen on the promenade des Anglais, a charming place, for the wide walk. Many nations are represented, many languages for many costumes worn, and on a sunny day the spectacle is as gay and brilliant as a carnival. Haughty English, lively French, sober Germans, handsome Spaniards, ugly Russians, meek Jews, free and easy Americans all dry. The equipages are as varied as the company and attract as much attention, especially the low basket baroches in which ladies drive themselves with a pair of dashing ponies. Gay nets to keep along this walk on Christmas Day. A tall young man walked slowly with his hands behind him, and a somewhat absent expression of countenance. He looked like an Italian, was dressed like an Englishman, and had the independent air of an American, a combination which caused sundry pairs of feminine eyes to look approvingly after him. And sundry... There were plenty of pretty faces to admire, but the young man took little notice of them, 
except to glance now and then at some blonde girl in blue. Presently he strolled out of the promenade and stood a moment at the crossing, as if undecided whether to go and listen to the band in the Jardin public, or to wander along the beach toward Castle. The quick trot of Pani's feet made him look up as one of the little carriages, containing a single young lady, came rapidly down the street. The lady was young, blonde, and dressed in blue. He stared a minute, then his whole face woke up, and, waving his hat like a boy, he hurried forward to meet her. Oh, Laurie, is it really you? I thought you'd never come, cried Emmy, dropping the reins and holding out both hands, to the great scandalization of a French mamma, who had... I was detained by the way, but I promised to spend Christmas with you, and here I am. How is your grandfather? When did you come? Where are you staying? I called at your hotel, but you were out. I have so much to say. I don't know where to begin. Get in and we can talk at our ease. I was going for a drive and longing for company. Flo's saving up for tonight. What happens then? A ball. A Christmas party at our hotel. There are many Americans there, and they give it in honor of the day. You'll go with us, of course. Aunt will be charmed. Thank you. Where now? asked Lurie, leaning back and folding his arms, a proceeding which suited Emmy, who preferred to drive, for her parasol whip and blue reins over the white ponies. I'm going to the bankers first for letters, and then to Castle Hill. The view is so lovely, and I like to feed the peacocks. Have you ever been there? Often, years ago, but I don't mind having a look at it. Now tell me all about yourself. The last I heard of you, your grandfather wrote that he expected you from Berlin. Yes, I spent a month there and then joined him in Paris, where he has settled for the winter. He has friends there and finds plenty to amuse him, so I go and come, and we get on capitally. That's a sociable arrangement, said Amy, missing something in Laurie's manner. Why, you see, he hates to travel, and I hate to keep still, so we each suit ourselves, and there is no trouble. I am often with him, and he enjoys my adventures, while I like to feel that someone is glad to see me when I get back from my wanderings. Dirty old hole, isn't it? He added, with a look of disgust as they drove along the boulevard to the place Napoleon in the old city. The dirt is picturesque, so I don't mind. The river and the hills are delicious, and these glimpses of the narrow cross streets are my delight. Now we shall have to wait for that procession to pass. It's going to the Church of St. John. While Laurie listlessly watched the procession of priests under their canopies, white-veiled nuns bearing lighted tapers, and some brotherhood in blue chanting as they walked, Emmy walked. He was handsomer than ever and greatly improved, she thought, but now that the flush of pleasure at meeting her was over, he looked tired and spiritless, not sick, nor exactly unhappy. She couldn't understand it and did not venture to ask questions, so she shook her head and touched up her ponies, as the procession wound away across the arches of the Pagliani Bridge and vanished in the church. Coupenses vows, she said, airing her French, which had improved in quantity, if not in quality, since she came abroad. That made Moiselle has made good use of her time and the result is charming, replied Larry, bowing with his hand on his heart and an admiring look. She blushed with pleasure, but somehow the compliment did not satisfy her like the blunt praises he used to give her at home, when he promenaded round her on festival occasions, and told her she didn't like the new tone, for though not Blaise, it sounded indifferent in spite of the look. If that's the way he's going to grow up, I wish he'd stay a boy, she thought, with a curious sense of disappointment and discomfort, trying meantime to seem quite easy and gay. At a Victor's she found the precious home letters and giving the reins to Lurie, read them luxuriously as they wound up the shady road between green hedges, where tea roses bloomed as freshly as... Beth is very poorly, mother says. I often think I ought to go home, but they all say stay. So I do, for I shall never have another chance like this said Emmy, 
looking sober over one page. I think you are right there. You could do nothing at home, and it is a great comfort to them to know that you are well and happy and enjoying so much, my dear. He drew a little nearer and looked more like Presently she laughed and showed him a small sketch of Joe in her scribbling suit, with the bow rampantly erect upon her cap, and issuing from her mouth the words, Genius Burns. Laurie smiled, took it, put it in his vest pocket, to keep it from blowing away, and listened with interest to the lively letter Emmy read him. This will be a regularly merry Christmas to me, with presents in the morning, you and letters in the afternoon and a party at night, said Emmy, as they alighted among the ruins of the old f while Emmy stood laughing on the bank above him as she scattered crumbs to the brilliant birds, Laurie looked at her as she had looked at him, with a natural curiosity to see what changes time and absence. He found nothing to perplex or disappoint, much to admire and approve, for overlooking a few little affectations of speech and manner, she was as sprightly and graceful as ever, always mature for her age. She had gained a certain aplomb in both carriage and conversation, which made her seem more of a woman of the world than she was. But her old petulant, Laurie did not read all this while he watched her feed the peacocks, but he saw enough to satisfy and interest him, and carried away a pretty little picture of a bright-faced girl standing in the as they came up onto the stone plata that crowns the hill. Emmy waved her hand as if welcoming him to her favorite haunt, and said, pointing here and there, Do you remember the cathedral and the court? It's not much changed, he answered without enthusiasm. What Joe would give for a sight of that famous speck, said Emmy, feeling in good spirits and anxious to see him so also. Yes, was all he said, but he turned and strained his eyes to see the Iceland which a greater usurper than even Napoleon now made interesting in his sight. Take a good look at it for her sake, and then come and tell me what you have been doing with yourself all this while, said Amy, seating herself, ready for a good talk. But she did not get it, for though he joined her and answered all her questions freely, she could only learn that he had roved about the continent and been to Greece. So after idling away an hour, they drove home again, and having paid his respects to Mrs. Carroll, Laurie left them, promising to return in the evening. It must be recorded of Emmy that she deliberately prinked that night. Time and absence had done its work on both the young people. She had seen her old friend in a new light, not as our boy, but as a handsome and agreeable man, and she was conscious of a very natural desire to find favor in his sight. Emmy knew her good points, and made the most of them with the taste and skill which is a fortune to a poor and pretty woman. Tarleton and Tull were cheap at nice, so she enveloped herself in them on such occasions, and following the sensible English fashion of simple dress for young girls, got up charming little Tull. It must be confessed that the artist sometimes got possession of the woman, and indulged in antique coiffures, statuesque attitudes, and classic draperies. But, dear heart, we all have our little weaknesses, and find it easy to pardon such in the young, who satisfy our eyes with their comeliness, and keep our heart. I do want him to think I look well, and tell them so at home, said Amy to herself, as she put on Flo's old white silk ball dress, and covered it with a cloud of fresh illusion. Her hair she had the sense to let alone, after gathering up the thick waves and curls into a heave-like knot at the back of her head. It's not the fashion, but it's becoming, and I can't afford to make a fright of myself, she used to say, when advised to frizzle, puff, or braid. Having no ornaments fine enough for this important occasion, Emmy looped her fleecy skirts with rosy clusters of azalea, and framed the white shoulders in delicate green vines. Remembering the painted boots, she surveyed her white satin slippers with girlish satisfaction, and chassied down the room, admiring her aristocratic feet all by herself. My new fan just matches my flowers, my gloves fit to a charm, and the real lace on aunt's much or gives an air to my whole dress. If I only had a classical nose and mouth, I should be perfectly happy, she said, 
surveying herself with a critical eye and a candle in each hand. In spite of this affliction, she looked unusually gay and graceful as she glided away. She seldom ran, it did not suit her style. She thought for being tall. The stately and Junos was more appropriate than the sportive or piquant. She walked up and down the long saloon while waiting for Laurie, and once arranged herself under the chandelier, which had a good effect upon her hair, then she thought better of it, and went away. It so happened that she could not have done a better thing, for Laurie came in so quietly she did not hear him, and as she stood at the distant window, with her head half turned and one hand gathering up, Good evening, Diana, said Lurie, with the look of satisfaction she liked to see in his eyes when they rested on her. Good evening, Apollo, she answered, smiling back at him, for he too looked unusually debonair, and the thought of entering the ballroom on the arm of such a personable, here are your flowers. I arranged them myself, remembering that you didn't like what Hannah calls a sot bouquet, said Lurie handing her a delicate nosegay, in a holder that she had long coveted as she did. How kind you are, she exclaimed gratefully. If I'd known you were coming, I'd have had something ready for you today, though not as pretty as this, I'm afraid. Thank you. It isn't what it should be, but you have improved it, he added, as she snapped the silver bracelet on her wrist. Please don't. I thought you liked that sort of thing. Not from you. It doesn't sound natural, and I like your old bluntness better. I'm glad of it, he answered. The company assembled in the long solo manger that evening was such as one sees nowhere but on the continent. The hospitable Americans had invited every acquaintance they had in nice, and having no prejudice against titles, secured a few to add luster to their Christmas ball. A Russian prince condescended to sit in a corner for an hour and talk with a massive lady, dressed like Hamlet's mother in black velvet with a pearl bridle under her chin. A Polish count, aged eighteen, devoted himself to the ladies, who pronounced him a fascinating deer and a German serene something, having come to supper alone. Baron Rothschild's private secretary, a large-nosed Jew in tight boots, affably beamed upon the world, as if his master's name crowned him with a golden halo. A stout Frenchman, who knew the emperor, came to indulge his mania for dancing, and Lady D. Jones, a British matron, adorned the scene with her little family. Of course, there were many light-footed, shrill-voiced American girls, handsome, lifeless-looking English ditto, and a few plain but piquant French demoiselles, any young girl can imagine Emmy's state of mind when she took the stage that night, leaning on Laurie's arm. She knew she looked well, she loved to dance, she felt that her foot was on her native heath in a ballroom, and enjoyed the delightful sense of power which comes when young girls first discover. She did pity the Davis girls, who were awkward, plain, and destitute of escort, except a grim paper and three grimmer maiden aunts and she bowed to them in her friendliest. With the first burst of the band, Emmy's color rose, her eyes began to sparkle, and her feet to tap the floor impatiently, for she danced well and wanted Lurie to know it. Therefore the shock she received can better be imagined than described, when he said in a perfectly tranquil tone, Do you care to dance? One usually does at a ball. I meant the first dance. May I have the honor? I can give you one if I put off the count. He dances divinely, but he will excuse me, as you are an old friend, said Amy, hoping that the name would have a good effect, and show Laurie that she was not to be trifled with. Nice little boy, but rather a short pole to support. A daughter of the gods, divinely tall, and most divinely fair, was all the satisfaction she got, however. The set in which they found themselves was composed of English, and Emmy was compelled to walk decorously through a cotillion, feeling all the while as if she could dance the tarantella with relish. Laurie resigned her to the nice little boy, and went to do his duty to Flo, without securing Emmy for the joys to come, which reprehensible want of forethought was properly punished. 
She showed him her ball book with demure satisfaction when he strolled instead of rushed up to claim her for the next, a glorious polka ridoa. But his polite regrets didn't impose upon her, and when she galloped away with the Count, she saw Larry sit down by her aunt with an actual expression of relief.